Sometimes a movie or show manages to be good enough at a few things to continue watching to see where it goes, but in the end finds itself in a neither loved nor hated middle ground that makes it just sort of there. And in that category of unfortunate mediocrity, we have Loki Season 2. It wasn't a flop by any definition of the term. Viewership data on the interweb is a little touch and go, of course, but it seems to have drawn in viewers rather than lost them between the debut and finale. And while the overall viewership is less than Loki Season 1, Everything MCU is down from two years ago. So what's a reasonable expectation, you know? Usually there's a backlog of video essays on all things MCU on YouTube, leaving me with precious little to contribute to the conversation. But this one remains oddly unreviewed. Well, okay, let's qualify that statement. Plenty of content creators have done things with Loki Season 2, but they aren't the channels I watch or an approach to movies and shows that I enjoy. So while I wish everyone luck in whatever brought them to a website for publishing videos, I'm not seeing my niche do much with this one. Well, fuck it. Let's make a video. It's a fun way to play with the content, provided that copyright claims give you a little room to breathe. So what's the dealio with Loki Season 2? Well, in the parlance of the standard video essay exploring story, character, world building, and theme, it does pretty good with themes, decent with characters, a bit shaky with world building to be charitable, and just awful with the story. If you're sticking around while I take a closer look at them things, thanks for your time. I'm Dr. Balthazar. Like, subscribe, all that ego-serving bullshit. A long time ago, I read an interview with Stephen King where he was asked how long it took him to write a novel. His response was he had no idea, since he didn't know how many times he would have to write the damn thing. The person asking the question didn't really understand, so to paraphrase his extended response, he said, I follow a story wherever it goes, until it reaches its logical end. But then I have to go back to the beginning and rewrite it, so that it moves with a clear logic from start to finish. And in doing so, more things may change, which means going back to the beginning again and again, cleaning everything up, otherwise the story will be filled with dead ends and breakdowns in logic. The writers of Loki Season 2 have never read this interview. So Loki Season 1 concluded with the final scene in which Loki Dog's friends had no idea who he was. Take it easy. You're an analyst, right? What division are what? you from? What are you talking about? Who are you? What's your name? So all the relationships he's formed across the first season are out the window. They have to start over rebuilding those relationships, or drop those characters, or find a reason why Loki Dog's friends don't know him. They solve this by having him involuntarily slipping forward and backward in time, in a location they established as being outside the progression of time. They solve that problem with a MacGuffin and a ticking clock, where a space harpoon is fired into the CGI sacred timeline, just in the nick of time, fixing things because of technobabble reasons. So episode 1 is more like episode 0. They had a technically well done ticking clock that created all the correct feelings of anticipation and exasperation, because they needed to solve the time slipping problem that existed because they needed to solve the last scene problem from season 1 where nobody knows each other. Well, at least they take the time to clean up their messes, but it's better not to make a mess in the first place than burn 45 minutes on fucking a throwaway scene in the previous season's finale. Episode 2 introduces two more ticking clocks. The first is an army of Kangs that are coming to wreak havoc, but they're like the White Walkers from Game of Thrones. They, they may be coming, but you have time to shower, grab a bite to eat, maybe run some errands before they arrive since they ain't in a hurry. The second is the sacred timeline is going to explode, which will erase all of existence killing bajillions in the vague sort of super huge stakes nobody can conceptualize, so nobody cares about. MCU writers have such a fondness of these days. She-Loki killing Season 1's Sword of Kang has caused endless timelines to start branching off the sacred timeline. That's way too much multiversal lameness, so reality is going to explode from redlining the stupidity of multiverses. Check out my video on why multiverses suck. They really do. The ticking clocks are a double-edged blade in Season 2, since viewers have to believe when time runs out, bad things will happen. So. Put a little hustle on whatever you're doing out there, the clocks are ticking. But most of the characters in the show can't believe this to be true, otherwise their behaviors make no sense. And sometimes the story has to slow down a bit since it can't just be a six hour sprint against the clock. So we're either frustrated by the choices of the other characters in light of the consequences they're apt to bring, frustrated that the pace of the story has slowed down when it ought not to in light of the consequences sticking around is apt to bring, or left with doubts about whether we should actually care about the ticking clocks. Episode 2 also has a good example of the breakdown of logic, with character motives and behaviors from the beginning of a concept to its end. Our heroes want to find Shiloki, so they get the information from a hunter, agent, whatever the fuck, who was tasked with finding her. That makes sense as a plot device. Our heroes need information they don't have, and they get it from someone who does. So, what's the problem? Well, the hunter was part of a rogue group that decided to nuke all the new timelines that have appeared. His stated mission was to find Shiloki, but that's just a cover story, while his actual mission is to help nuke the timeline branches which he approaches by actually going out and finding Shiloki for no discernible reason, then putting himself in an alternate timeline that's going to be nuked and living a life as a celebrity actor seemingly for a meaningful period of time. If his motivation is to nuke the timelines of his homeboys, he wouldn't do those things to accomplish that task. 
but the script has a couple ideas on a storyline function, so it does what it does without cleaning up why he would go from A to B to C in universe. Anyway, the second episode ends with the branches of the timeline getting nuked, killing bajillions of people that suddenly existed and now suddenly don't, and she Loki is located by Loke Dog and Mobius, not Morbius, the lame wad vampire. In episode 3, the boys set out to find a variant of the season 1 Sword of Kang because they need him to open a door. I wish I was joking about that. They lost the ability to open a fucking door. They devise a plan to fix a timeline that is identical to when they fixed Loke Dog's time slipping. In episode 1, they walked out the same door, onto the same platform, fired off the same space harpoon, into the same CGI representation of the time stream. But now, they need a Sword of Kang variant as a MacGuffin to open the same goddamn door for reasons. Finding the Sword of Kang variant gives the writers a chance to talk directly to the audience about how they conceptualize time as threads woven together by a loom. And while I appreciate clearing up some of the mechanics of the world building, we are three episodes and one full season too late to be explaining the mechanics of the sacred timeline. Viewers are either just going with the flow at this point, or have stopped watching the show altogether. The series in general is best experienced by the emotional right side of the brain, while the logical left side turns off as best it can. Nothing good comes from asking questions regarding the story or mechanics at play in that world. The double-edged nature of the ticking clocks is especially clear in episode 3. The story needs to slow down and take time for characters to interact in order to develop them a bit, and I like that sort of thing. But there's still a pair of ticking clocks overshadowing everything, leaving the impression that you don't have time for any of this, get your asses in gear. Anyway, both the heroes and villains want to grab the variant Sword of Kang, and the heroes get him. Episode 4 opens with a cartoon AI clock and whatever baby girl villain's name is having a flashback moment with the first bit of Disney messaging. You didn't just help. It was you who commanded the army. And while he sat on his throne, I continued to do all the work to keep him there? Well, something like that. They made it through almost half the season before pandering to modern women. Good for them. I didn't think they could hold their breath that long. But then again, the mouthpiece of the message is one of the villains, not one of the heroes. When a hero expresses their value system, the expectation is they're expressing a concept the viewer identifies with. When the villain expresses their views, the expectation is we may sympathize with them to some degree, but we don't share in their ideology because they're exaggerating, mistaken about something, or misapplying an idea in some way. We've all come across someone in the workplace who's pretty close to useless, but is convinced in their own mind the company couldn't exist without them. They're the only ones who work hard. They're wildly underpaid. And in their delusional minds, they never get the credit they deserve. Useless co-worker stereotypes are pretty good archetypes for villains. Well done. Anyway, these two are interfering in the hero's attempts to save reality, which makes logical sense insofar as they don't know or believe in the ticking clocks. But they take a moment to murder the rogue agents who nuked the other timelines earlier in the series, which is a bit off as far as intended audience reaction is concerned. The scene works in reinforcing how evil the two villains have become, but the rogue agents nuked the alternative timelines, and the show made a point to express those were filled with real people, not just lines on a screen. So the victims we should have sympathy for are the biggest mass murderers this side of Thanos. If Joseph Stalin and his cronies were violently murdered after killing millions of their countrymen, should people have mourned the loss and felt some animosity for their killers? The scenes are well acted and technically very well shot with what they choose to reveal and obscure, but you just can't think during this show or nothing makes sense. There's also an homage to Back to the Future that's a nice moment for those that recognize it. Let me show you my plan for sending you home. Please excuse the crudity of this model. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. Here's a model I mocked up with the loom. Forgive the shoddy and slapdash work. Uh, it's not to scale. I only got one coat of paint on there. I haven't been able to carve out figures to represent all of us. References can be fun when they aren't overt fan service bullshit. The episode ends with the Kang variant running out to fire off the space harpoon and save the day and a like-for-like -like recreation of the end of episode one. But instead of saving the day, he gets one foot out the door and explodes. The timeline then detonates and everyone is wiped from existence. Game over. You lose. Okay, unexpected. I like patterns of repetition in movies and shows. Having repeating scenes or lines of dialogue allows the viewer to better understand how much has changed, either in the narrative or our connections to the characters. But I have to wonder if this could have been a surprise ending for episode 1. You could then leave episodes 2 through 4 on the cutting room floor before moving into episodes 5 and 6 and tack everything into the back of season 1, making for a single miniseries rather than two seasons separated by two years and 50 yards of horseshit that was the MCU phases four and five. But like I said earlier, I don't think the writers ever made their way to the end of the story and then went back to clean it up from start to finish when it came to this project. Episode five starts with Loke Dog once again having the power to time slip, which season one sort of Kang somehow gave him from beyond the grave. Great writing there. Though he still has no control over it, which lends further weight to my argument that episode one could have been Loke Dog trying to save both reality and stop his time slipping, 
only to fail, rather than this power being a thing that disappears from episodes two through four, only to return in episode five because the plot needs it to. Anyway, he's pulled through time and space to interact with his homeboys, where almost any useful character building dialogue from the previous episodes could have been edited in. And the episode ends of Loke Dog mastering the time slipping by believing in the power of true love or deciding to just go for it. Or, I don't know, using a Care Bear stare. Or something. I don't know. The fucking script needs him to have the power to control time at this point, so he just does. Episode 6 starts with an homage to the Edge of Tomorrow and its time manipulation, allowing for endless do-overs, as Loke Dog keeps redoing the Space Harpoon scene until they finally fire the damn thing off, only to find their concept of the exploding timeline is fundamentally wrong. The universe doesn't cease to exist when a timeline detonates. It just defaults back to the sacred timeline where either Season 1's Sword of Kang is resurrected, back in charge, or the White Kang walkers are prevented from their slow march. Or, I don't know, something to that effect. I'm not entirely sure. Exhibit letter, whatever the fuck that you shouldn't think while watching this show. Anyway, Loke Dog breaks the loop of the sacred timeline defaulting back into existence by taking on the role of Season 1 Sword of Kang and creating a multiple timeline tree in a reference to the Tree of Life from Norse mythology. Igra, Igra. Yggdrasil. Right, the Tree of Life from Norse mythology, rather than a single sacred timeline thread that he oversees in place of the not quite Kang. So he's now the god of time space fulfilling a glorious purpose, rather than the god of mischief. We can have alternate universes without the army of bitch made white Kang walkers rolling into town someday, unless the MCU recasts Jonathan Majors and runs with the Kang concept in phase six. Who knows, it's not made explicit. Roll credits, this isn't a good storyline. For world building, we have some complex and confusing mechanics the show never makes simple. If you're working with heady sci fi concepts, it's best to create one or two rules and keep reinforcing them. The flux capacitor lets you travel through time, and it runs on 1.21 gigawatts. The TVA is outside of time, except when it's not. The TVA members have realities they properly belong in, except when they don't. The sacred timeline is preventing the White Kang walkers from arriving, except when it's not. The timelines are going to explode, except when they're not. Time is woven through a loom, except when it's not. Pruning branches off the timeline is mass genocide, except when it's not. Time threads are infinitely expanding, except when they're not. Boris wrote the handbook and timelines, except when he didn't. Loke Dog has no control over time slipping except when he does. The rules of this world are a fucking mess and seem prone to retconning at any given moment if they get in the way of the plot. In truth, the story has no sound logic and the world building establishes few meaningful rules governing its existence. But it's filled with characters and themes that either redeem the show for a viewer or don't. Mobius, not Morbius, the limp dick vampire, wants to do right in his work with the TVA, but maybe he's denying himself a better life in a timeline which would be more fulfilling. We can understand the struggle to find a healthy balance between work and our personal lives. He clings to his work through much of the season until he's ready to have his character arc conclude, and has his ideas challenged throughout by various characters, as well as being counterpointed by a rogue agent whoever the fuck, since that dude made the choice he's struggling with to experience life outside the TVA. That's good from a character development perspective. There may be some metacriticism embedded in the rogue agent whoever the fuck, since as a celebrity actor, his life is one of privilege and he's willing to compromise on any moral question to get back to that life of privilege, although he does suffer because of it. Not terrible work there either. Baby girl villain is understandable as an ambitious modern woman who thinks she needs to be the leader she's destined to be. She's dreaming about becoming the leader she knows she can be. And nobody is giving her the credit she thinks she deserves. She Loki is understandable as a character who wants a simple life after experiencing trauma, although she felt a bit like an ex-girlfriend who has moved on much faster than expected, so Loke Dog still has some complex emotions while she seems strangely and callously over it. After you have some time to recover from a breakup and the rose-tinted glasses come off, you tend to see your ex is not quite as perfect as when you were in love with him. I can't tell if they deliberately made her look a bit more old and haggard in Season 2 as compared to Season 1 to reinforce that concept, but nice job if that was deliberate. I think the writers mistakenly believe the audience has a better understanding of who she Loki is than we actually do two years on from the first season. She prefers working at McDonald's to helping prevent the apocalypse for reasons that aren't explicit. She's long past any romantic connection with Loki Dog, though season one was two years ago in reality, not in universe. She feels intensely about the alternate timelines getting nuked, and lectures the audience for not caring about these theoretical tragedies through a dialogue ostensibly of Mobius, not Morbius, the bitch-made vampire, but clearly meant for us, or reasons. It's the only character I feel like they really fumbled, since the Sword of Kang variant was a MacGuffin, not a character. Doesn't count. She could have added an extra layer to Loke Dog's self-sacrifice at season's end, since he'd be giving up true love as well as friendship and community. But ah well, missed opportunity. The rest of Loke Dog's crew are quirky enough in their personalities, so the world feels populated with characters that are a bit more interesting than, say, the Marvels. Oh, high praise indeed. You did better than the Marvels. But oh, okay, you get what I mean. 
With the Loki character, it's been over a decade since Tom Hiddleston took up the horn headwear, so it's been something of a journey we've shared with him across however many films. In this world outside of time, the character has found friends who care about him, and potentially a life and role in the TVA that could be fulfilling, in a way that an Asgardian god or king of whatever couldn't. I don't think I'm alone in wanting a sending off for him with a happily ever after ending, and all that sounds pretty okay. But it's not to be. He struggles with the decision, but in the end sacrifices the things he wants for himself to protect the people he cares about. Individual needs are set aside for the greater good. Personal ambition must be thrown aside in the one great sacrifice for our country. He's found a glorious purpose after all, by sacrificing himself for others, which is a true 180 degree character turn from when we first met him back in 2011 in the first Thor. I know what kind of god I need to be. For you. I don't keep up with comic books these days, but to my knowledge, the Loki character is now a god of stories instead of mischief. So the final destination of the MCU Loki lining up with the current comic book iteration feels a bit on a thoughtful side as far as such things go. Series like The Wheel of Time, Witcher, and Rings of Power seem intent on telling fans of those IPs and other media to go fuck themselves real hard. So hey, thanks for not being a dick on that one. For themes, the show touches on the concept of free will versus predetermination. The sacred timeline would be the predetermined path that God concepts has decided everyone will live their lives according to, while the endless branches of alternate timelines would represent free will. The season one Sword of Kang's imposition of predetermination has been replaced by Loke Dog's protection of free will by season's end. However, it only touches on these concepts in roundabout ways, so it's more of a representative theme than an explicit one. The theme of obligation to others versus indulgence and self-interest plays out through the choices of the members of the TVA, especially Mobius, not Morbius, the prissy vampire, as well as Loke Dog sacrificing himself to protect the timeline tree. Soldiers in a time of war struggle with a similar choice, sacrificing their personal ambitions and maybe their own lives on behalf of a nation that may or may not have any gratitude for it. The other main theme of the show would be the idea of letting go and saying goodbye, principally to Loki after our 12 years of the character, but also to the other characters in the show. Anything's possible, of course, but like as not, they won't be returning to anything in the MCU, at least in the immediate future. It's a universal struggle. How do I say goodbye to this life and the people in it when they're all I have? How can I let you go when I love you? Be it a romantic love or love for friends, family, community. How can we make a choice that calls for saying goodbye to the people who mean so much to us? The answer, of course, is life is hard on those that live it. When you choose to let people go when they pass on, or life moves on without a place in it for them, because that's life. It's hard to let go, isn't it? Yes, it is, Bill. And that's life. What can I tell you? Thematically, this isn't bad at all. And while I can't say these themes are explored of depth and introspection, the Disney Plus series have set a pretty low bar for something to qualify as comparatively well done these days. So in summary, Loki Season 2 is a slog of a story through the first four episodes, with frustrating breakdowns in logic that does get good by Episode 5, world building that is rich in characters that are interesting to watch and interact, but operates on rules and mechanics that are just dumb fuckery. It touches on themes that are interesting enough. It does some good things, is well acted of costumes and sets that look very impressive, but it's neither great nor terrible, and sometimes being lukewarm just leaves you easily ignored. But all criticism aside... The Loki character has always been one of my favorites in the MCU, so I'm grateful they made a second season to say goodbye. If this is the end of the story, he'll be missed. I already made some prescriptions for alternate realities and time travel, which I still don't like, when I expressed my dislike of multiverses in a previous video, so to take a different approach, I'm prescribing some movie choices related to the show's themes, as I understand them anyway. For the struggle of free will versus predetermination, my prescription is Minority Report. For a soldier's sacrifice of self on behalf of the group, all quiet on the Western Front, and for the struggle of letting go of a loved one, Shutter Island. Anyway, that's my thought for the day. I'm Dr. Balthazar. Thanks for the view. Like what you like, don't what you don't. That's all your call, Kimasabi.